So while we're waiting for a couple more minutes, you can take a look at this picture and try to determine what all these people have in common.
snow removal equipment. So if there's a big snow, we sell, sell the ice, ice melter, we sell the shovels. Uh, so say there's a big snow storm in, in Buffalo, New York. Buffalo is right by the two lakes. They get tons of snow, even more than Chicago, if you can believe it. All right, so there's a big snowstorm in Buffalo, New York. All right, we have sales reps and we have stores in Buffalo. What we're going to be able to do soon, and other companies will be able to do the same thing, is, all right, so now there's a big snowstorm. That's a sales opportunity. We sell, we sell snow, snow shovels, we sell ice melter, and a lot of other things to help people deal with big snows. We, can be able, we would be able to, to uh, uh, put into our system parameters that say, send to our sales rep's cell phone a list of all the customers that during the last snowstorm in Buffalo bought ice melter and bought, bought snow shovels. All right? So that that sales rep can go out and call on those customers and say, hey, what? You know what? Last time we had a big storm, you bought these supplies. Do you need them again? Not only can you do that, but you can route it through a GPS. So if the sales rep's at one of our stores or whatever location if they're at home, you can route it through a GPS that it can tie into their car. So their car can direct them to the most efficient route to go to those customers who bought that snow, snow equipment the last time the snowstorm occurred. And we know exactly what they bought and say, hey, you know, do you want to buy more of this? And by the way, is there anything else you need? So that's one example of the way that technology is changing the way that business operates. Uh, another example is um, is the, the use. Of, how many of you seen these commercials about the cloud? All right, the cloud. You know, let's go to the cloud. Does anybody know what the cloud is? All right, what the cloud is is it used to be a company like Ranger or any big company when they when they ran systems that supported their payables, receivables, how they did their sales, and so forth, that all of the systems that, that supported that business were operated by a data center that that company owned. You know, they, they owned all these systems and the computers and the data, and there were some building or buildings that that company had where they stored their systems and then they had people that maintained it. What the cloud means in today's day and, day and age with, with the, the computer network so powerful and the internet so powerful, is that you as a business, if you wanted to start up a business, you wouldn't need to necessarily buy all of those data centers or all the people to support it. You can go to, and there's a company, for example, called Salesforce.com. What Salesforce.com does is it provides you with a, a, a sales management tool, a customer relationship management tool, that you can basically uh, sign up with them, they store it, they run it at their facility, and then you're able to use that capability to run your business. You don't have to buy all the computers. You don't have to pay, write people to run the computers. You don't have to pay the people to program the computers. You can just plug in and say, I want to use your service, and it's a service somewhere on the East Coast, uh, and I want to plug into it, and then I want to be able to run my business using that capability. So what the cloud is, it's applications and systems that businesses use to run that they don't own or reside in their own facility. And because of the emerging technologies, many more companies are now starting to use the cloud to add capabilities to their organization. That means that, that companies that want to start up, that companies want to change, can change faster because they now have this capability. So, so technology itself is changing very quickly. And what it means is the rules of the game about what you got, got you here as a business are changing. Okay? More and more people, how many people here shop online? All right? How many people shopped online maybe two, three years ago? Not as many. More and more people are shopping online. Companies are getting smarter about making it easier to shop online, and so more business, more and more of the business today is being conducted online. So as leaders in an organization, what you need to do is say, hey, you know, the way that we used to do things in the past is one way. We now need to adapt because technology is enabling our customers to work in a different way. I, mean, I don't think it's necessarily off topic, but when you talk about having the cloud, then the cloud can be in India or it can be in China, <laughs> and yeah, so it can be and it might change for. You know, Absolutely. It, it can be in India, it can be in China. A lot of, you know, it's always infamous the fact that a lot of uh, uh, help desk support, when you call somebody for support, it's routed to India and you're talking to somebody in India. Same thing. It could be in India, it could be in China. In fact, sometimes when you sign up, you don't know where your data is. In fact, one of the risks of the cloud for some companies is it's on somebody else's computer and you don't know what they do with it. Okay? And for a lot of companies, their data is gold, right? You own it, it's a, it's a it's a capital asset for an organization. So the cloud has some benefits, but it also has some risks because of what you're describing. Uh, it could be off in India somewhere, or China, or even you know, in, a, in an exposed site within the US. So yeah, very good, that's, that's uh, one of the challenges with it. But the point is, 
uh, for most companies, what got you here isn't going to get you through the next 10 years, and technology is part of it, a big part, part of driving that change. Uh, the other thing that's changing is the generations. Okay, now this is about people. This is the first time in U.S. history there's, there's actually four generations of people working together in the same environment. There's the traditionalists, which are people being born before 1945, 1946. The baby boomers, of which I am one, uh, from 46 to about 63. There's the Generation X, I think, which is from 63 to about 80, 81. And there's Generation Y, or the millennials, from 81 through the present. The first time we've had four generations. What's distinctive about that, why that's important, is the needs, the wants, the desires, the behaviors of each of those generations are different. I know I've got a 26-year-old daughter that thinks very differently from me as a baby boomer. As a baby boomer, uh, my values are, you know, your work, your loyal, I've been with Granger, a typical baby boomer, I've been with Granger for 31 years, uh, I've had only six sick days at work because I'm gonna, darn it, I'm gonna be at work and help my company win, right? My daughter, who's 25, is on her second job since graduating college. Uh, she's looking for not what can, you know, what can I do for my company, but what can my company do for me? and has a very different set of values. You have to, but what that means is, as leaders, that you need to act and respond differently and recognize that the needs of that generation are different than the ones that you have and the values that you have. Gen Y is, you know, the, the, uh, the, even the younger folks right now, the current generation, uh, has even, uh, uh, you know, kind of different characteristics. You know, one of the things that's kind of unique about the Gen Y folks, and, and some of you may have kids that grew up in, in, that, in that era, is, uh, sporting events are different. You know, sporting events, you know, when I was a kid was you either won or you lost. You played a baseball game, you either won or you lost. In the Gen Y, a lot of the kids have been brought up that, you know what, we're not going to keep score. We're just going to, you know, going to play and we're going to have fun and we're not going to keep score, okay? And then, you know, they play the game and then there's not like a award for the winner and there's an award for the loser. It's like everybody played, everybody gets an award because you all try hard. Okay? And that's, you know, that's the uh, over-characterization, but from a generational standpoint, that's the way that the current generation is brought up. What that means is if you are a leader, okay, that you have to understand that that's the way that Gen Y folks brought up. Gen Y folks need a lot of attention. They need a lot of care. I know that the Gen Y folks that work for me, I had to put in an extra effort to spend time, sit down, and do some mentoring, because they require more care and feeding and feedback than the Gen, gen, uh, than the, uh, the gen X folks or the baby boomers. So part of being a leader and part of being flexible is to recognize who am I working with, what generation are they from, what are the values of that generation, and I need to be flexible. If I try and impose my style, uh, on an individual that doesn't share the same values or culture or beliefs, then I'm ultimately going to lose because I'm not going to engage that person. So the more that you understand that, the better. And then the final change that's going on is environmental change, which really relates to sustainability. Everybody, you know, right now as everybody's talking about being green and making sure that we're environmentally friendly, that is, you know, that is something that's picking up in steam and is changing the way a lot of companies operate and the things that they do. So when you think about leadership as you go forward, uh, the key message that I bring, and I, I'm 55 years old, I've been at Granger for 31 years, 31 years, and the keys to survival for me in terms of continuing to add value is, um, is the, the desire to change. I read a lot, I go to a lot of seminars, I talk to different people, uh, I do reverse mentoring. I, have, I mentor a lot of people within Granger, uh, you know, younger people on leadership and so forth. But I do something called reverse mentoring, where I take some of the younger people or interns that have come into the organization, and I have them mentor me about what the needs are of the generation of people that are coming in. So when we bring people out of college, I'll sit down with them after they've been with Granger for a couple months and say, you know, what's Granger look like? I'm here for 31 years. I am the culture. I, I'm blinded to anything outside of it. So tell me what you're seeing. Tell me what works for a person of your generation, and tell me what, what I need to think about or do differently because the world's changing. And it is amazing how smart these kids are and how much you learn from that, if you ask. Uh, and it really changes the way that you think about it. So um, I know that just in terms of one quick story, I, I was getting some mentoring advice from one of the interns, because we want to hire more interns from universities. Right? It's doing well, we want to hire more, more interns. And this is a 23-year-old kid at the University of Illinois, a really sharp kid. And I said, what can we do to more effectively recruit people from like the University of Illinois? And he said, uh, well, you know, first thing you've got to do is you've got to stop sending these older folks 
to the school to be recruiting. You've got to have somebody show up that looks like me. And he said, so you've got to stop selling, sending Glenn, and you've got to stop, stop selling Tom. Well, Glenn and Tom are in their early 30s. He's telling me he is. So I'm thinking, you know, that's great advice, but these are the young people to me. So uh, I clearly I'm never going to be able to set foot on a campus. <laughs> you know. So then you realize, you know, uh, some, of the, uh, some of the differences, and by gosh, you know, we're all getting older. So. All right, so those are some of the things that are, that are driving change. So when you look at leadership, what I want to talk about is the few of the L's. You know, the first slide has some L's. So I want to talk a little bit about some of the L's about, uh, you know, that go along with, with, with leadership, uh, the development of changing leadership. And I guess, you know, the, the, this got now gets down into some things you can think about as you're working, as you're leading people, as you're working with people, well, how to deal with different situations. So the first one is, is situational leadership. And let me describe that briefly. Many people, when they <clears throat> ask them, what's your leadership style, they say, my style is, you know, I, I'm the sharpest person, and I tell people what to do when they get things done. Okay, so that's style one. On the other side, you've got somebody that says, you know what, I'm all about coaching and mentoring people and letting them do what they want to do, and then if they fail, they'll learn from their failure. Okay, and then there's, there's examples in between. And so, you know, there, a lot of people gravitate towards one leadership style. If you're going to be a leader in an organization, you know, the best thing you can do is, is, is lead based on the situation that you're dealing with. So in other words, um, if you've got, it's not just to have one style, but be flexible and analyze the situation and then figure out what style fits the best. So for example, if you're dealing with, like if I'm dealing with a young intern that's working on a certain task or activity, it's the first time they've done it. That person has never done it before. And so the leadership style that you would use is something that's more direct. Okay, you would say, here's how you do it. Here's how you know you're successful. Let's check in on a periodic basis to make sure you're doing it right. And if they get it done right, you praise them. And if not, you give them, give them some feedback. But that's, that's a directive leadership style. That's me telling them what to do, not because they're bad people, but because they haven't done it before. All right? um, as they move up the learning curve, then, you know, what you do is they start getting a little bit better. You start being still directive, but you also start supporting them. Or you start giving them, you know, let, them, you let, let loose the leash a little bit. As they get even better at what they're doing, you're more highly supportive and low directive. You're kind of checking in, saying, how are you doing? Are you doing okay? But if the individual is doing well because they're now learning, then you're not having to tell them what to do anymore. And then finally, when they've mastered something, and they've done it a couple of times and they've done it well, you don't really need to, to watch over their shoulders. You don't need to micromanage. You let them do what they need to do, and you just provide you know, uh, feedback when they're done, but you let them go through and, and get that work done. You delegate it to them. So the point of this slide, uh, in kind of taking a summary back, is there's no one right leadership style for dealing with people in different situations. It's understanding what's the job that needs to be done, who's doing it, how skilled are they, have they done it before, if they haven't done it before, you kind of tell them more and you're more directive. And if they've done it before and they've done it successfully, then you're more delegated and you just provide general coaching, so, you know, uh, encouragement, but you don't have to micromanage. So leadership, in one sense of being flexible, is about analyzing the situation and then figure out what's now that's best. Yes? I just wanted to point out with Percy and Blanchard's model here. Yes, great. And, uh, <clears throat> oftentimes, these are cyclical as well. Because organizations are not static. Your membership changes, like in the Toastmasters Club. People come and go. So you may at one point have graduated to delegating behavior. That may change as new members come in. And you've always got to be flexible to the, the mix of members that you have. And you know it's not, it's not hard and fast which, uh, which style you're going to use at any given time. But, Again, the flexibility is the key aspect. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, and this is a somewhat famous model that, her, that uh, who, who was her, 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 Percy, Percy and Blanchard, Blanchard right, put together. And it basically said, adapt your style to the situation. And, and as was mentioned here, is that's going to change over time. You constantly have to analyze it. If you're going to be a leader, the best thing you can do to be a leader, and I talked about this last night, is to constantly learn and to checkpoint. You know, when I talked last night about leadership, I mentioned the fact that um, uh, one of the things that I do to get feedback is not only the reverse mentor, but I, every two years I do a 360 degree review. Uh, have, you, have you guys remember the 360 review? All right. And what that is, is you ask, uh, there's a whole series of questions that you send uh, that are standard, that are that's administered by another company. And you send it to your boss, and you send it to your peers and your director.
read the reports and some of the other people that work for you, as many people as you can, and ask a set of questions about you as a leader and your behaviors and how you conduct yourself. And what you get back is an assessment that says, here's your strengths uh, that people feel you have, here's the areas of improvement, and then here's the direct comments that people made about your style. Okay, and so for example, when the last uh, 360 I got back was uh, somebody said, you know, you're always, a, you're a really positive guy, but sometimes you're too Pollyanna. And when you go into a situation sometimes, you know, it's, it could be an impossible situation, but you're gonna think there's gonna be some way to, to resolve it. And sometimes people feel like you don't have a good grasp of the real world, okay? And that was a direct comment in the feedback, because that's what I asked for. So not only did I take that to heart and, and was appreciative of it, and you don't have the name of the person or whatever, but to me, if you're going to show leadership, is I take the surveys and I review it with my boss, I review it with my peers, and I review it with the people that work for me, and say, here's where you say I'm doing well, here's where I need to improve, and here's some direct comments. What I need from you is if you see me doing this poorly still, then let me know so that I can adjust. All right? Yeah, yes? I have a question as far as if you have a lot of employees or people that work under you and they're all on different levels, yes. do you go through the whole leadership style cycle or is it a medium leadership style that you can adapt to people that are on different levels as a whole? Uh, great question. Yeah, if you got a lot of different people, a lot of different skills and capabilities at different levels, uh, to me, I guess the best answer is it, it, it's, it's not based on position or an organization or it's based on What's the job the person needs to do, and how well can they do it? Have they done it before, or is this new to them? And so it's all based on the individual and the task, uh, no matter what level it is. And that's how you then, then adjust it. Because there's some people that may work for you, directly for you, that aren't good at something, and somebody a you know, level or two down is, okay? And so you still then uh, uh, analyze it based on the job and the situation. So, okay. Does that answer your question? I mean, kind of. You just it still goes to one on one, one on one interaction. Yes. But I guess my concern is, what if you have three, four hundred employees or three, four hundred people that work under you, and they, you have people that are in their thirties, the then you have the generation wires, and they're all supposedly doing the same job or they're carrying out the same tasks, but they have different needs. So as a leader, do you take the coaching? point of view because you, you know they're not too far. You know you don't have to really direct them. You decide to coach and then work from coaching, supporting to delegating, or do you do directing, coaching, supporting, delegating, and go through the, the full cycle of the leadership styles? If, uh, it depends on how quickly somebody picks it up. If somebody's new to a task, okay, and so they're here and I got you have to tell them what to do. Some people get through this real quick. Some people can go from here to here pretty quickly depending on the task and how sharp they are. Others, you have to go through the cycle. You again, the, the best way to do it is you've got to analyze it based on how are they doing and next time it comes up, based on where they're at, which style do I apply. There's not a one size fits all. Uh, you have to analyze it based on every situation that you have. Yeah, great question. Um, so, you know, so the situation leadership is about being flexibility. Uh, leadership is also about uh, reflection and self learning. Uh, the best leaders uh, understand what their strengths are and what their weaknesses are. Um, many years ago, uh, and, uh, I worked for somebody who is now the president of Granger, and we were putting these systems into our, our warehouses across the country, and I was responsible for it. And if the, the, the implementations went well, I used to send out voicemails to a couple hundred leaders in the organization. And if they're going well, I'd send out the voicemail, and then I'd also send out some humorous anecdote along with the voicemail just to kind of pick people's spirits up. And uh, this, this gentleman, Jim Ryan, pulled me aside as we were, I was doing this, and he said, you know what? He said, I understand why you're doing it, I understand why you're putting these anecdotes in, but he said, I want to tell you something. He said, the way that you're doing it isn't necessarily projecting the image of you as a leader. I know you're trying to pick up people's spirits, and it's a hard project, and you're trying to get people to enjoy it more, but as, as, as our leaders hear this, and they look at who's going to be a leader in the organization going forward, the image you're projecting isn't necessarily matching that. So I just want you to know that, okay? And it was a great learning for me. I addressed it my style a little bit, but not too much, because I still like, see it, I still like humor. But the point is, if you're gonna be a leader and you're gonna grow, the easiest thing for you to do, no matter what job you're in, is to figure out what are my strengths and weaknesses today, and accept that, and then use that as the basis for learning. So. All right, um, I, I talked a little bit about generational already, and so I won't go through this too much, but um, wanted to mention one thing that, that, that at least at Granger, why we think to kind of show you why we think it's so prominent. Uh, at Granger, we have these things called generational, we have business resource groups, and it's sponsored by our diversity group. 
we have an African American, an Asian, a women's aid, uh, a business resource group. We have something also called the Generational Business Resource Group. The business Resource Group is intended to provide a common community, community for people to learn and grow based on the various interests that we have and the various sets of diversity we have within the organization. A lot of organizations have, you know, the, the women and African American and Pacific, uh, Asian Pacific and so forth. We're the only one that has one from a generational standpoint, uh, as far as we know. And, and the reason is we recognize that, that the generational differences are there and they're growing and the more effective we can understand them and work with them and then train our managers in a way so that they're more, more in, tune, in, in, in tune with those changes, the more effective we're going to be. We want to be more effective. We want to be a great place to work. And if we're going to do that, we need to better understand the needs of the workforce that's coming in. We also need to understand not just for the young people, but for the people in my generation. You know, when the economy hit and people's retirement plans didn't quite go as they wanted, right? Uh, people, there's people, baby boomers that had hoped to have been retired that are still working, right? And as a result, when you're working, you want to be relevant. You don't want to just be there and get a paycheck. You want to be there and you want to contribute. And you want to, you want to know that, hey, I, I want to have the opportunities to grow and mentor people and have them leverage the benefit, get the benefit of my experience. So we're not only focused on trying to be more attractive to the young people in the, in the world that we're trying to hire and build into the organization. We're also trying to be equally attractive to the baby boomers who we know can add value because they have many years of experience and knowledge that they can impart. All right? And so that's part of the reason we have a, a generational business resource group. Yes? Does it, well, and, and I don't know if you but does this help in the retention? I know, like the company I'm at, it does seem like mm -hmm. uh, the story is so very similar to your daughter. Yeah. It's an engineering company. You, you, we invest a lot in training all these engineers, you know, and then yeah. five, six years later when you can really start getting the, you know, the real true pay payback, mm -hmm. they leave. Yes. Mm -hmm. And does this help, I guess, that probably the company supports it in a way of trying to keep also the tension of Yeah, does it help us retaining the people that we're making this investment in? Uh, it's starting to. We have a retention issue similar to what you're describing, where we make some investments, people work a few years, and then they and then they move on. It's not pronounced, but it's there. And so what we're doing, for example, one of the things this Generational Business Resource Group did is we have leadership training programs for our managers all over the world that are being developed. And the next round of leadership training, our generational BRG uh, work with our HR department to build uh, into the program uh, information about generational differences and how you manage across generations. So we're actually taking this, we're building the training managers that our managers all over the globe are, 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 are uh, going to get because of this very issue. We, re we recognize that some of the interns were leaving, that uh, in part we weren't showing up the right way with those interns. We weren't competing with what they were hearing other companies were, were doing to retain them. They weren't seeing enough of people like them that they could look in the mirror and say, hey, you know, boy, I can see other people like me. Uh, so we're, much, we're aggressively going after it as a result. So, yes? <coughs> Exactly the same, but it's much more consistent than across the generations. So 
So we haven't delved into, okay, within the boomers, are there subsets within the boomers at this point? Uh, we're not far enough along. But what we did do is say, amongst the boomers, what are the issues that are common amongst all of you? We surveyed all our members, and we use that to help drive the kind of programs that we put together after that. And then possibly when we get into it, we may find that it breaks down even more within the boomer generation. Some of those are pretty well. So, yes? Um, I'm basing my comments on my own experience at Rotary Xerox Corporation. And what I would say to that is each, within each diversity group, like you know, gay and lesbian or uh, Asian or something, Every group has a story, a, a kind of history, and depending on what generation you're in, inside of that diversity group, you know the story about the people of your ethnicity, for example, of that age. You know what I mean? So within each diversity group, yeah, there is these, there are these generational uh, uh, differences because each
is we're going to be first determining with our folks who are you? We're going to be doing 360 degree assessments and some other um, emotional intelligence assessments. And the idea is before you start down a road, you know, uh, our, our, our old uh, chairman of our company, Dick Kaiser, used to say, if you don't know where you're going, then any road will get you there. All right? And the same thing goes for leadership development, right? You don't want to start just trying to develop yourself or develop your skills. You want to know where you want to go, what the leadership requirements are. And you also want to know where you're going to, where you're starting, where are you at today. And the best way to do that is to do 360 degree reviews and some other assessments so you can figure out what's my leadership style, what are my natural tendencies, what am I naturally good at, what do I need to maybe focus on. Then you look at career history in terms of the work you've done and, and what kind of leadership you've already provided. And then what you do is you use that to say, okay, well, what, what, how can I take that information and create my own personal development stand so that I can grow my skills? I mentioned yesterday when I presented that in front of the group that from a leadership development standpoint, you are accountable for your own development. And a lot of people, so many times when we do surveys of our, our people, they talk about the fact that, well, my manager doesn't do this and my manager doesn't do that. Even if you have a bad manager, ultimately you're in control of your own development. And you've got to figure out ways to be able to get around that. Because the more you make excuses, the less you're going to do it. And I guarantee you, the more you reach out and say, I'm going to take accountability, the better off you're going to be. And so what we're doing with our managers now is doing these assessments so we can figure out at a personal level, based on where you want to go, what kind of job assignments can we give you, what kind of training opportunities can we give you, what kind of mentoring that we can give you. Um, our model in, in general, in terms of growing skills, is it's 70% uh, experiential and 30% um, training. So in other words, you know, you don't you don't make a leader by just sending them to a bunch of training classes and then all of a sudden they come back and leader, right? About 30% of the time that you spend developing somebody, uh, we use for formal training and other programs. 70% of it is experiential. It's giving somebody a job assignment that's maybe greater than their current job, but gives them the opportunity and the chance to to learn on the job, get some coaching, and kind of have somebody coach them so that they learn on the job they're producing. Uh, but they're also learning on the job. So we do a, like a 70-30 split when we try to do that. So leadership is about flexibility and it's about developing, developing your own skills. Um, the last thing I want to talk about relative to leadership before I kind of recap the little bit I asked today is um, uh, a personal belief that a big part of leadership is about inspiration. You know, a lot of people when they think about leadership and being a manager, they think about the tactical things about it. You know, giving assignments and talking to people and you know, helping them grow technically and so forth. And there are a certain some amount of technical components you have to have as a manager. Um, but I think one of the things that gets missed and gets missed a lot in the training that people get in colleges and so forth is that leaders, leadership is about uh, inspiration. So I want to tell you my personal all-time favorite story about uh, people and people development, something that, that speaks to my philosophy on what I think leadership is about. And it's a short story, and I hope, uh, so hope I don't screw it up. But uh, so there's these two women that hadn't seen each other in, in several years, uh, Mary and Jean. And so Mary goes to Jean, you know, Jean, how are you doing? Uh, you know, I, the last time you were together, you were gonna, you were gonna marry Pat. Did you, did you, you know, uh, did you marry Pat? And she goes, well, no, I didn't. She said, well, I'm really surprised because you thought Pat was the best person in the whole world. And she, the other person goes, well, you know, I did, uh, but then I met Jim. Okay, and I married Jim. She goes, well, why did you do that? She said, because Jim, Jim makes me feel like I'm the best person in the world. Okay, and the reason I like that story is, if you're gonna be a leader, now, it's, it's great if your people feel that you're strong and they have admiration for who you are and what you do. You certainly want that from your people. But I think what's even more important is how people feel about themselves. And if you can make people feel good about their career, what they're doing, their contributions, if you can be direct with them, if they've got perform, you know, performance needs, and to let them know in, a, in the right way that here's the things that I'd like to see you improve on because I want to see you succeed, and if they know that, then I think that's a, a true sign of leadership, and that's the kind of leadership that I think people like to follow, and I think what makes really great leaders successful. So, you know, it's so, like I say, it's great that they may have admiration for you, but I think the more that as a leader, you can focus on the needs of your people, uh, you know, uh, and, and make them feel good about where they're at, give them a sense of purpose, uh, then I think uh, the more effective you're going to be as a leader. And the other thing that goes along with that is you create lifelong friends. I, I can't tell you how many people uh, who used to work for me many years ago that were either in the company or outside the company that I had great relationships with because 
we not only uh, work together well as you know boss and, and individual you know and, 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 and employee so to speak, but we establish friendships in a bond because of the relationship we established, doing great things, but doing it in a way that everyone grew uh, as a result of the process. So just you know, to me, if there's anything I can impart on you in terms of what I think great leadership is. It's making people feel great about who they are, what they're accomplishing, and the time that they spent working with you was time that they view in their lives as something where they really grew as a person. Uh, that, I think, is a great sign of leadership. Um, how many of you were in the discussion yesterday, uh, in the presentation yesterday, we talked a little bit? Okay. So I want to share one other thing um, on leadership uh, that, um, uh, yesterday I talked in the meeting about the unwritten rules yeah. of an organization, right? Uh, and, and uh, the, the, the concept of the discussion was about the fact that many people as individual contributors, when they go and they want to interview and they want to be a manager, they get rejected for that manager's job. And they're saying, well, why did I get rejected? Because in my performance reviews, I did a great job. I, you know, I did all my assignments on time, I was under budget, um, my boss gave me an exceptional rating, I was rated five out of five, so why didn't I, you know, so now I'm going to apply for this manager's job, why didn't I get it? And uh, so many times I've interviewed people that have had this, had, had this issue. What happens is when people get performance feedback, they get feedback about the job that they're doing, not necessarily the job that they want to go to. And many times the skills that you use in the job you're at don't necessarily match up against the job that you want to go to when you want to be a leader. Um, and there's a, a gentleman by the uh, name of Harvey Coleman out of uh, who worked at IBM who did a study on, on this concept of the unwritten rules in an organization and what drives uh, the ability to get ahead. And he came up with this concept called the PIE concept, Productivity, Image, and Exposure. And the reason he came up with it was that when he worked at IBM, he was one of three, lead, uh, one, one leader of a, a division at IBM, and there were three divisions, he was leading one of them. And on two or three occasions, uh, when a promotional opportunity came up, he was passed over, even though every year his division was the highest producing division. And he said, well, obviously he was an African American. He said, obviously uh, IBM has a bias against me, and he quit IBM because he didn't get the promotion, even though his division was the highest, highest rated uh, division. Years later, he kind of thought about it, and he actually went back into IBM, and he did a study to try to find out, you know, what was really going on? Was it really because it was an African American, or was there something else there? And he interviewed some of the people that actually didn't select him for the job. And what they said was, you know, you, you did a great job. But, you know, the, the image you projected in doing it didn't fit the image of the job that you were going after. Because we're looking for somebody that's going to lead a broader organization, and your image as a leader didn't match that. The other thing was, you know, we kind of knew you were putting up some good numbers, but we didn't know much about you. You didn't relate to people. You didn't network. You know, there wasn't a lot of knowledge about you, whereas the other people that got selected, they had been out there. They had been attending lunches. They're, you know, they do different things within the organization. And when people said, who do we think the best candidate is, your name consistently came up. And so Harvey took that as a learning. He's created a company now where he does some great training around this concept. Uh, and uh, he, he's a consulting company. And he's, he's, uh, he's, he, he came up with this concept called Pi, which says there's three components to your ability to get promoted and to become a leader in an organization or grow in the leadership plan. The first is productivity. You have to be somebody that deliver, consistently delivers. You know, that's the baseline. That's what everybody needs to do. But what you need to do is, is deliver every time. The second is you have to have a projected image uh, that's consistent with the job that you want to go at. You know, I told you before, Jim Ryan told me, hey, you're doing a great job, but the image you're projecting is more, more one of somebody that's a little college, so to speak, not somebody that's going to be a director or something in the organization. I'm just telling you, you can decide which route you want to go, but the image I was projecting wasn't that of the job that I aspired to, and so I either needed to accept that and change a little bit or accept the consequences. Uh, and so that's the other thing. And then third is uh, you want to get exposure within an organization. Exposure says, I'm going to grow my personal network. Uh, a lot of people view it when, when somebody gets promoted and they look at that person and they say, well, obviously that, that person got promoted because they just know people. Okay, and I don't know people. And it's not about what you know, it's about who you know. And people look at that as a negative. And, and the answer to that, you know, I guess if you look at the pie theory is, is it is somewhat in part about who you know. And that's the rules of the game that we need to accept. And so accept it and grow your personal network. A big part of being promoted uh, in, in an organization is about creating your own opportunities within and outside of even your department by networking with other people and 
letting them get, get to know you. Okay, and it may sound unfair, but, it, it, but it's true. Uh, many years ago within Granger IT, we had 580 people in IT, and we went through a massive reorg in 2007. And the way that we did the reorg is our vice president, our CIO, he selected his next level managers. Those managers selected their next level of managers. And then we had giant org charts on the wall with empty boxes. And um, what we had to do is each manager had to come in and say, here's the people that I want to put in these boxes. Here's the people I want to put in the manager's roles. Here's the people I want to put in these other roles. What's yellow mean? Yeah. Like two more minutes left. Oh, okay. All right. So, uh, um, <laughs> uh, so, so you know, and, and so what each of us had to do was get up there and say, I want to put uh, Jen in this role, I want to put Sophia in this role, and so forth. Now, we also had in the middle of the table binders and binders of everybody's performance reviews, and not once during the two days we went through this exercise did anybody go and look at the binder to say, I want to know more about this person. It was about George saying, you know what, I know Jen and she's done some really good work. She did this for me. George may have worked with her for two days on something, but he's expressing his input on something at the same level as somebody that's worked with Jen for two years. All right? And I'll tell you what right now, that, that isn't just a Granger idiosyncrasy. That exists in all organizations. Okay? And that is the rules of the game. That's the one that people don't like, but if you accept it, then what you do is you do something. Okay? You go out. Uh, I know I had somebody on my team who admired a director in another team. Another team. She said, "You know what? I'd like to get some coaching from you, and just maybe once a once a quarter, sit down at lunch and learn what you think about things." Okay. And now they've got a strong relationship. Okay. And now when we're looking at giving performance reviews and maybe some some bonuses, when her name comes up, I've got somebody in the room that's supporting it because she knows her. He knows her just because they've had lunches, and she he gets to know her more as a leader. So for you. The opportunity is to you know, accept the rules of the game and play the game. And don't fight it, but, but be a part of the game, and it's just going to make your life a lot better. Plus, you get a lot more out of it, because the more you talk to people, the more you learn, the more you grow as a leader, too. So, so, um, so those are just some of the thoughts about leadership. It's about flexibility. It's about a fast-paced world. It's about us being accountable for growing our own skills. Uh, and it's about great opportunities come up, coming up, giving them the pace of change that's, that's coming at us.